Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. I see a couple of people are writing, so I just want to make sure that everybody can hear me and we're ready to go. My name is Alex McFedrin, and I will be presenting the second part of this webinar. Uh, the webinar today, the theme is Team B Deployment and Logistics, and we're working on specifics that are relevant to UNICEF deployments. Today joining me is Jennifer Gatto, Program Officer for UNICEF HQ, and myself, uh, based in Geneva at the WHO, but working for UNICEF. In order to ensure that we have a good quality of sound and the recording is good for colleagues that cannot join us, I ask that you make sure your computers are muted um, or your microphones and that there's really not a discussion while the presentation is going on but afterwards we'll have time for questions and answers and that's really the important time where uh, you get to ask direct questions to myself and Jen and we're also joined by uh, Sahar Higazi who was with us for the last webinar and some other colleagues I think in New York. Uh, if you have any problems hearing or, or seeing the webinar, please send a message using the IM tool that's in the, the bottom right of your screen, or bottom left, my apologies. Uh, it's a little speech bubble, and we'll answer that uh, as soon as possible. As well, if, if you have troubles because of the connection, please note that you can phone in with one of the phone numbers that was provided with the invitation. So to get underway, uh, today's contents are uh, presented in two parts. The first part is by Jen, who will introduce herself shortly, and myself. We're going to cover um, just an overview of the Global Polio Eradication Initiative's um, surge policy, where the, where the roster policy comes from, and then discuss the tours, uh, the current kind of cases and outbreaks, and then a snapshot of the whole. And then we'll follow up with my, my part of the presentation, which is more on logistics, your contract negotiation, travel arrangements, and the beginning of your mission, what that would look like. And at the end, we'll have questions and answers. So now I'll hand it over to Jen, who will take control and introduce herself, and then pr present part one. Go ahead, Jen. Great. Thanks so much. Um, so, uh, a warm welcome to everyone. It's, I'm just looking at the participant list, and it's really nice to see some familiar names. Um, sorry, just one moment. Okay. So, um, again, my name is Jennifer. I'm uh, Jennifer Gatto. I'm working as a program officer here at UNICEF, um, based in New York headquarters. I've had the pleasure of meeting some of you virtually by email or through calls or through the interview process. So, um, we're just really happy to have the opportunity today to to brief you a little bit on the roster progress and um, just reiterate that we're really grateful for your continued interest in working with UNICEF and also with GPEI in our, in our, what we hope is our final push towards the polio eradication effort. So a warm welcome today. As um, Alex mentioned, I'm just going to run us through a, a brief intro. Um, we'll look at a quick map of where we've had polio outbreaks in the last year. I'll talk a little bit about the HR surge. Um, I'll give a little update of the four TORs that fall under the, the, the SOPs. Um, we'll give a snapshot of the Team B role and some of the deployment process. So with that, I'm going to jump to the next slide, four. So um, <clears throat> the Global Polio Eradication Initiative um, has updated their our SOPs um, in April 2016 and really outlines the polio outbreak response and preparedness uh, measures that we need to take. Um, the updated SOP is really detailed um, a required rapid and effective emergency response. We did have a more uh, in-depth dive into the SOPs in a webinar that we did about two weeks ago. So if you weren't able to um, make that call, we'd be happy to circulate the presentation later. But it really gives a nice overview of the SOPs themselves. So the GPI surge, we really think of it in two phases. Team A, which is our staff, uh, our staff surge, um, that really goes in in that first, uh, within, ideally within that 72 hours um, to kick off the response. And then we have this Team B that would come in 
um, about a month into the response to really manage and close the outbreak. I'll go a little bit more de into detail in the, in, into the team A and team B in a later slide, but just wanted to give you a, an idea of the policy. Um, in addition, we do have this independent monitoring, uh, monitoring board that um, looks at the GPI on, uh, three times a year. And it's really in this last reports and meetings has really reiterated the, the importance of GPI's ability to respond rapidly to outbreaks. And we ourselves know that we need to work even harder to get our outbreaks right. Um, the GPI, all of the GPI partners, um, are working together to maintain a joint agency roster. Um, it's a, it's a, a platform that which we call Expert, and most of you should have your profiles already uploaded into Expert and, and be familiar with the system. Um, we we are going to give our regional offices access to this platform, so we do encourage you to keep your um, availability as updated as possible there. Um, for for the for the roster that we're discussing, UNICEF provides vaccine management, CCL, C4D, and um, health and immunization consultants as needed. Moving to the next slide, five. Okay, so here we have. We wanted to just give you a little. Uh, a, a, give you a map. This is from uh, our most recent map up from October 4th, just showing where we've had um, polio outbreaks in the last 12 months. So you'll see our two endemic countries, Pakistan and Afghanistan, and then unfortunately recently Nigeria has also been added back to the endemic list. In addition, we've had um, circulating vaccine-derived polio virus type 1 in Myanmar um, in the purple there, and then circulating vaccine type 2 um, in both Guinea and Laos, and you'll see them these tiny green dots. So we just wanted to give you a sense of where over the last year we would have had consultants deployed. Uh, moving on to the next slide. Oh, I think I'm going too fast. Okay. So I'm on to a slide called Polio Outbreak Response, Surge Deployment Team A and B. Um, and this really just provides a, an overview of like once the polio outbreak is confirmed, we consider that day zero. And then ideally, in, in accordance with the SOP, we really want to get some, we want to get someone that's been pre-identified as staff member to the outbreak country within 72 hours to support the country team and really beginning the response. So our team A is really made up of experienced UNICEF, experienced GPI staff, so from each of the agencies. Um, these are pre-identified and uh, confirmed to be on standby per quarter. Um, we have uh, just generally the GPI teams consist of a health and um, a health expert, which is really managed by WHO, a C4D expert, an ops expert, and up to this point, UNICEF has really been putting forth that C4D kind of expertise. So. 72 hours, Team A gets deployed, is there for about one month, and then in the meantime, we'd be working on identifying a Team B person who could um, take over, like sort of take the baton from Team A and really be with the country, supporting the managing and closing out um, the outbreak, hopefully. Um, so I think uh, we'll jump to the next slide. We wanted to give you, okay, um, we have we have four TORs that fall within the SOPs, um, and we just I wanted just to to preface this by saying that our TORs, you know, a clear TOR can be difficult really in an emergency situation. So it's, a, it's when you get deployed, it's really important to have an understanding between you know your in the country office if, you know, interruptions to the work may occur or if there's amendments. And it's really, these are generic TORs that we have, and of course they're kind of fit into the, into the context of, depending on the type of, you know, country and type of emergency. So we just wanted to give you an idea. These are really the main four. We have the outbreak coordinator, um, which is really managed by, which will really be supplied by WHO. We have this operations manager, also most likely supplied to the team through WHO. 
And then we have a, logist, a cold chain logistics and vaccine management focal point and uh, a communications officer. And that the CCL, vaccine management, could be either WHO or UNICEF. And then the POMS will always be the, the responsibility of UNICEF to put them the resource, like the resource person hold for both Team A and Team B. Um, again, as I said, the, the generic GPI TOR will be adapted um, to suit the country's specific needs and objectives. Uh, and we will circulate. We have each of these uh, TORs available, so if you're interested in kind of going into depth and reading each of them, we can provide those after the call. Um, we wanted to give you a, I'm just going to jump to the next slide, which is slide eight, oh. <laughs> where, where I really wanted to give you a snapshot of like the communications TOR, what would be, you know, what you might be working on when you get deployed to the field. So the communications officer will support the team at the country office and ensure that the response is definitely aligned with the government and Ministry of Health. Um, Ministry of Health's plans and strategies, and that it's aligned with the latest outbreak SOPs. Um, more generally, um, the duties is we really want to assess the communication needs and existing capacity at the country level, and then also be continuously reporting to WHO and UNICEF headquarters on the progress, on the achievements, and where additional systems may be needed. Now, these next two bullets, we just kind of extract. We have a number. It's pretty ex extensive. In the TOR, like all of the activities that you might be engaging in, but we just pulled response, as well as um, working on developing, updating, and reviewing the data on immunization knowledge and attitudes and behaviors of the target audience, especially the high-risk and mobile populations. External comms may or may not be a part of your TOR, but we did include it here. Um, so for example, if you're deployed, you know, you may be requested to conduct a media landscape analysis or support the outbreak response teams to prepare an external communication strategy, including the engagement with political, religious, and community leaders and other stakeholders. So we just wanted to give you an idea of some of the things that you might be working on. We'll definitely share these, the TORs with you if you'd like to like have a more depth, more depth look at all the activities that could be possible. So I'm jumping to the next slide, slide nine. <clears throat> and we wanted to give you um, a, a sense of uh, you know, when a, a consultant is contracted, we think of deployment in sort of three three chunks. So it's we have pre-deployment, we have kind of during deployment, and then we have that sort of offboarding, um, uh, final final reporting and uh, evaluation. So I just wanted to take you quickly through kind of each of these um, areas. So pre-deployment would be uh, we, you can expect that. You know, once you're contracted, you'll receive a full onboarding deployment package containing key tech technical documents um, so that you, you're able to read up on these before you arrive in the country. And then you'll also um, um, have an onboarding call with HQ and uh, regional local points who can brief you on the situation, a little bit on expectation, and we really want you to be set up for success before you, before you land in country. Uh, so during deployment, um, if it's for an outbreak, um, then the co consultant would take part in bi-monthly calls with HQ and RO vocal points, as well as provide timely updates as required. Um, you'll work on the key deliverables that are stated in your TOR, and then you may also be asked to provide additional support and reporting for what we call outbreak response assessments, or otherwise known as OBRAs. Um, and then there's that last leg where, the, you know, where we conclude the deployment. You would be expected to have a briefing with colleagues in HQ and RO to submit a final report, and then also to complete this post-deployment satisfaction survey. 
And this really is really valuable for us because it allows us to learn where we could potentially, you know, um, make improvements on the whole experience. So we really appreciate that um, special last step. And I think that's it for me. Um, um, I will pass back to Alex now. Great. Thank you so much, Jen. So for the second part, we're going to build on some of the things that Jen talked about uh, and look at more of the logistics that you might have in mind before you get to the country and then the first things you would do in the beginning of the country. So the key areas here that we've, we've pointed out is that the Global Polio Eradication Initiative is a partnership. So you're going to be working you know, with other agencies if you're deployed in the field, but this also means that there's different human resource guidelines for each agency and to keep that in mind. So WHO has a different way of doing some things than UNICEF. Uh, as well, each hiring office or country office um, is managed differently and so the, con the contract and your deployment is largely dependent on this as well as um, the country context and things such as that. And as well, as Jen pointed out earlier, the generic tour will be adapted to, s to suit the country needs and objectives. And it's important to make sure you know the deliverables and the times and the expectations for your role in that country, not just the ones for the generic tour. And, and lastly, but definitely not least, is that GPI partners often overlap, and it's important to know where you position yourself in the partnership. Um, and one thing to, to really remind yourself here is that you do not speak on behalf of UNICEF. Um, no, nobody does, and it's important that if, if you get in a situation like that, that you revert to your supervisor and, and let that be handled at a higher level. So if you go into the first aspect of logistics for a consultant, that is the contract negotiation. And we use here the word negotiation because this is between you and the hiring office, which is usually the country office. And you wouldn't want to negotiate your daily rate, uh, the final terms of reference, so the tour, the duration of the contact, and travel to the duty station, as well as if you're going to have any leave for leisure or in case of emergency. It's really important that as a consultant you discuss this directly with the country office um, and ensure that you have a clear understanding of what your contract includes and what it doesn't include. Below on the left here you see the different um, operations documents that you will need to submit including your P11 form, the vendor form, things like this. And then finally on the right, what the country office is responsible for. So they will provide an email address to you, an organization email address if, if they deem this as necessary. They'll facilitate the visa process by providing a letter of invitation, but if there is a visa cost, that is the cost uh, responsibility of the consultant. And a logistics note if they have one prepared. Now the next part of your negotiation is your travel arrangements um, to and from the country office. And this is not necessarily included in, uh, in the contract, so this is something that needs to be negotiated. An important part of travel when you're a consultant with UNICEF is security, and you're required to complete basic and advanced security training uh, through the UNDSS porthole uh, before you travel, and that has to be shared and cleared with your operations manager or your supervisor at the hiring office. You would be provided really in detail uh, description of how to go about this, if need be, um, as well as that you would do a travel security trip clearance, which is another aspect of UNDSS for each trip that you would do while working as a consultant uh, for UNICEF. So this is really important just again that you understand these things and these bullets are really good to refer to if you have concerns before your travel and knowing what, what costs are, um, are covered by the consultant, which are the visa, uh, vaccinations and things such as this. The main thing here that we want to discuss are a number of in-country considerations. So because we're in a, a time of emergency probably um, with a polio outbreak, things will be very busy at the country office. So if the country office doesn't initiate a discussion on these topics, we really encourage, and you're encouraged by the country office, to make sure you have an understanding of, of these topics. So for instance, with supervision, it's important to note who is your supervisor by your tour, and if you have co-supervision, to understand what that will look like, um, and so forth. And this is something to discuss with the country office and, and make very clear. 
The next thing is the initial briefing, which would happen upon your arrival. So that would be where you would meet colleagues, where you would have an understanding of the context of what's going on, you would get orientated with different things, um, and that usually would also include security, a security briefing. And this is very critical uh, because some areas, as we know right now, um, areas where there are polio outbreaks, they, they can have instability in inaccessible areas. So to understand what is the security situation and also what your insurance will cover. So you are required as a consultant to have insurance that also includes emergency medical evacuation um, and that's your response as a consultant. But also make sure if something were to happen in the field in an insecure situation, what are you covered for and how will the organization uh, assist you or not assist you. So to know that and the parameters around your job, what's permitted and isn't. As well as I mentioned before, the interaction with partners is really important to know um, how to work with others. If you're going to be um, sitting at the UNICEF office or in the field, if you're sharing you know, transport and doing a case investigation in the field, different aspects like this. Um, that's again something to clarify with your supervisor. Transport here we're referring to is um, in country, if you will be using a UN vehicle or provided transportation, if you're asked to use public transport, if you take a, a leave for some time, are you able to use a budget airline or is that not covered by insurance? So these are all specifics that your operations manager can answer for you. Location of work refers to if you'll be working in an office or in the field. Um, often, you know, some people think, oh, if I work from home, then I, I, I can still be paid. That might not be the case, so that's something to clarify. As well as accommodation, typically a country office will establish a hotel or something for the first few days uh, that will be paid for by the consultant, but they'll arrange that for you when you arrive. Um, but after that, you would need to find your own accommodation. So asking about this before you get there, doing some research, knowing what is covered, what isn't covered, or where would be a good place to stay. And finally, computer and software. You need to ask if you will be provided a computer or if you need to provide your own. And the software is important because often consultants can come in with a different type of computer than the standard organization computers and provide really good work or feedback or reporting, but then this isn't transferable to the office or is lost when the consultant leaves. So we suggest that either the CEO and or the consultant bring up these issues and, and together have a clear understanding before you depart or early upon your arrival and that way you can focus more on uh, your actual work once these logistics are out of way. And last, before we get to the questions and answers, just wanted to touch on field preparedness. For field preparedness, what we're really talking about here is just being able to hit the ground running. So having all the information you would need you know, before you get there so that you can really apply yourself and integrate with the team and have a smooth transition and handover from Team A. So the first bullet here is to know the country context, which is the people, the culture, traditions, and religion. Uh, this is really important for both um, cold chain logistics and also for C4D especially. Uh, practical information such as clothing and food and work culture. So clothing, for example, when I worked in Kenya, I wasn't able to um, wear shorts. And so it's really important that I dressed appropriately so that people received me well and, and, and I showed respect to the community I was working in. And obviously, very important here is any information you can get on the situation, uh, on the EPI information, current SIAs, what's already happened, case investigation reports, and the outbreak plan is really useful so that you know the context of your work and, and what you can add to value to when you get there. And this can be received from the country office, and of course, if uh, they're very busy, it's very welcomed for you to request that. So finally, um, sorry for any cut, cutting out, uh, but of course now we're going to move to questions and answers. So if you have questions and answers, uh, if you if you missed a part that I, I spoke about but you weren't able to hear me, please ask and, and we'll try to answer it now. Um, so we'll ask you to use the IM tool that you have been using already to, to let me know you couldn't hear me uh, and ask your questions and then we'll try to share them uh, with whoever can answer them best. The first question we have here from Mafuzo is, uh, as a consultant, are we being covered for health insurance? Uh, and that one I, I did touch on, uh, but I will say quickly that as a consultant, you are required to provide your own health insurance, and that's uh, the responsibility of the cost is yours, and the coverage needs to include uh, emergency medical evacuation. 
I don't know, Kathy, would you like to add anything to that? Um, to even become a consultant, at least from HQ's perspective, we require that the consultant is covered by an insurance for the duration of the co consultancy. Okay, so the question there, Mafuzul, is as a consultant, you are required to provide your own health insurance, and, and that has to be um, demonstrated before the contract will be completed. Now, the next question we have is from a Kamel. Yeah. Um, regarding the outbreak coordinator, should it be from the WHO excluding UNICEF recruited consultants? I'm going to pass this one to Sahar, if she can answer here. Uh, thank you very much, Kamal. Uh, this is an excellent point. Indeed, the answer is no. There is normally, yes, the WHO usually takes the lead in the, the, in the polio coordination on a country level, but it is not mandatory. And uh, usually also when there is an outbreak, there is an active and serious search for the best candidate with the best profile who can be uh, acting on behalf of GPEI, not on behalf of WHO, on behalf of all partners to be able to coordinate and respond as effective as possible. So definitely a UNICEF background can be very much uh, um, a coordinator, and there are plenty of examples, and I don't want to start naming specific uh, colleagues uh, and former uh, staff members who have been recruited at one point by WHO, and then uh, in another round, in another outbreak, we from UNICEF took them back and they became our consultants or lead coordinator. Over. He asks here, is, uh, does the UN allow DSA, uh, is it applicable throughout the assignment? So I'm going to pass this over to Kathy. Broad question, so I'll try and answer this best I can. Um, back to Alex's point earlier, it's really between you and the hiring office about the understanding with regards to DSA. Um, it depends on where the consultant is recruited from. It depends on whether if you're recruited in the same like country office, if you're within commuting distance, are you expecting DSA for coming to the office? Like I'm not quite sure like what that question's really asking. Um, so I'll just be general and say it's between you and the hiring office. But generally what at from the HQ experience, when we do deploy consultants, we pay them a contractual rate, their daily rate, and then the DSA of wherever we deploy them to. So hopefully that answers your question, Zahid. Um, Jennifer and Alex, I'd like to come on this point as well, because I know it's a critical one, especially for our colleagues who might want to join for a long time, like three months or six months deployment on Team A and to, uh, Team B, sorry, and to complement what Cathy said. Uh, as part of the negotiation, and depending on the cost of living in the country that you're being deployed to, assuming that you're coming from outside this country, all of this is counted and factored into your discussion with the country team. So, for example, if you are in a country that is known to be the cost of living there is in and, and by default, the contracting office would be taking this into account and by discussing it, they will factor this in, uh, in as well. Uh, in other situation, when uh, the cost of living is known to be uh, low, it might be like a package or a, a lump sum whereby you would receive the, the, the fees as well as the incidentals of the GSA to cover your uh, cost of living. So as Ed, Kathy and, and uh, also Alex referred to that, it's very much negotiable, but it all comes with several variables that our colleagues in the field and in the country offices do take it into account and do consider all these different variables uh, in, and take it into consideration. Over. Thank you very much, Kathy and Sahar, for both of those answers. I guess the, the really important thing here is that it's a negotiation with the country office, and, and that's where, as a consultant, uh, that's your responsibility. The next question we have here is from Kamel. It is, there is no information on individual contracts versus institutional ones. And I'm going to pass that back to you, Sahar, as well. Um, following also, there's another question for Sahar here that suggests, um, from Mafuzo, who has SOP training but now working with either WHO or UNICEF, should he or she be called to support an outbreak? Um, Sahar, if you want to answer those two, thank you. Uh, 
On the first one of uh, Kamel, uh, we're here talking or referring to more of the contractual uh, uh, agreements between UNICEF as an organization and the uh, individual contractors. We are not talking about institutional contracts, which is completely different arrangement that was not part of this discussion. And as long as the uh, contractor, for example, is coming in his name as an individual, all the information mentioned here would apply. Um, on the second question, I'm, I'm really sorry, Alex and uh, Mahfuzul, I'm not sure I really understood the point of the SOP training and either WHO or UNICEF. So if you would please clarify. Maybe I could come in here. Mafuzul, are, are you saying that you're now a staff member of either WHO or UNICEF? Yes. Okay. So we could be in touch offline because we could potentially request you for a Team A rather than a Team B. Okay. Because you are staff now. So we could touch base um, offline. Thank you. Okay. Thanks so much. Okay, the next question comes from uh, Bedrul. Among the current UNICEF staff members, other than C4D comm staff, what will be the role of uh, immunization officer specialists uh, when deployed in Team A or Team B? Jen, I think I'll pass that one over to you. Okay. <clears throat> Um, we do have a TOR for immunization <laughs> officers, and um, so you would you would take on the role of that TOR when you get deployed as a team B, a team A, a team a or a team B person. So it, you wouldn't you wouldn't you would take on the role of that TOR. Uh, but Trul, also just um, we can if you don't have the TOR. Um, I'll, I'll just make a note of your of your name so we can send you um, the TORs for the more health the health immunization specialists if that if that would be helpful. Um, it sounds like the internet connections is really bad from the UNICEF office. So Jennifer, I would suggest that you carry on the moderation, please. Maybe that would help a lot. Thank you very much, Jennifer. No problem. So um, I'm from Brad. Um, we, we do a presentation after the call, so after we, we end. And then I'm just going on to Martin's question on my understanding is that the contract with the consultant can be either with SF or WHO. So that, that is true. We're using now, you know, if you've had previous, you know, relationship with WHO or you've been deployed by WHO in the past, uh, uh, platform now. So, most, I mean, because we would most likely be doing the contracting for you and be reaching out to you to, you know, as a C4D resource. Martin. Do we have any other questions? Oh, I'm sorry that you've been having some audio um, issues. We will have a recording of the call after. If, I mean, hopefully you were able to follow most of the presentation. So um, maybe I'll just give maybe one or two minutes more for questions. Um, we hope that it's been useful for you. We wanted to give, you know, we really appreciate uh, your interest, again, in working for, you know, in wanting to work for UNICEF and joining our, you know, this final push towards eradication. So we wanted to provide all of our consultants with an overview of the SOPs and try to answer any questions you might have about the roster and the deployment process. Um, Kamal, I'm just reading, since this presentation is applicable to individual contracts, are you planning to have other sessions on inst institutional contracts? 
Um, I don't believe it's planned at this time. Um, Sahar, am I am I right in that? Yeah, because uh, in, do, in fact we do have uh, a schedule that is uh, probably would take us for another quarter or two quarters actually of different uh, burning topics. However, Kamal, if there are particular points that you would like to clarify, uh, please type them for me offline uh, on a, an email message with uh, copy to Alex, Kathy, and Jennifer, and we will be all glad to support as far as we would be able to. Many thanks. I think I will wrap up our webinar. A special thanks to everyone who took the time to join us today. Um, we hope that we were able to give you a, a nice overview and answer your questions. So please, uh, you have both Alex and myself's email, as, as well as everyone. Sahar, thanks so much for putting those in. So if you have um, any questions on logistics or any, you know, anything that pops into mind um, from the presentation, please feel free to uh, drop us a line, and we'll try to get back to you as, as soon as possible. So um, I'm sorry that we lost Alex, but thanks so much for, um, for facilitating, and uh, we hope to be in touch soon. Thank you so much.